Uh, Chris started us in a new series and then left town, obviously, and uh, Acts chapter 1. And uh, actually, I'm really uh, glad to, to have us look at this uh, second half of Acts chapter 1, talking about uh, what do we do in the in-between times? Because sometimes, uh, you know, you, things are going and you're clear and you're energized, your adrenaline's pumping, and, and, and times when it's not happening. But what do you do when you're in that in-between uh, and you're waiting and you don't know whether you should take action or whether you should wait for the Lord? You don't know what to expect or what to do. And, so, and that's what we find with the, uh, uh, the early church. Um, Jesus has ascended into heaven uh, and they were standing around and, and they were told, get out of here, it's gone. You know? and, uh, and so then verse 12, they returned to Jerusalem from a hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. And then they named who was present, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, all the uh, disciples. And they all joined together, constantly in prayer, along with the women, with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and also with Jesus' brothers. And in those days, uh, P Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, The scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was the one of our number, he was one of our number, and he shared in this ministry. Uh, in a parenthesis, it says, uh, with the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field where he fell headlong, and his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled, you know. Uh, everyone in Jerusalem had heard about it. And so Peter uh, says, for it's written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in. Then he added another verse from Psalm 109. Uh, May another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time uh, the Lord Jesus uh, went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two people. Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justus, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of the two you've chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. <laughs> then they shot craps. <laughs> <laughs> they cast a lot. They took dice and rolled them, and, and dice fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. So, Lord, teach us from this. What do we do in the in-between? How do we trust you? How do we hear your voice in our life? And how do we follow you? That's our need today. In Jesus name. Um, have you ever spent time in between? In, in between answers, in between solutions, in between? I mean, I, I'm not saying this is anything like being a, writing a book is anything like delivering a baby, but... If my water breaks today, you know, I'm out of here. Uh, I feel like, you know, I've been never ready to push, you know. But um, I think, my theory is that we're, we're always in an in-between time, this side of heaven. Every minute of our life really is an in-between time. Um, so what do we do? How do we handle that? How do we live in it? Uh, and uh, and grow faithfully when we're in the time between answers, between solutions, between guidance. And I like that the uh, that Acts shows us what they did. First of all, they all joined together. Started out with a few of them, and more than that, got about 120 people, and they and they they stayed together in community. It's. Uh, it's very, I, and having been in isolation for a couple of months, it's really easy to kind of veer off the road. Uh, I could go up tributaries in my mind since I'm ADHD, and, and, and you never see me again, you know? I just, ooh, ooh. But, um, but there's something powerful in the gathering together. And, and when, the, when, when uh, God calls us 
together, like, like we're called together to be a church. Even though, you know, the bulldozers are going to come and knock this building down, we're going to be somewhere, um, and we need to stay together for comfort, for encouragement, for uh, hope, and for something that, that I, I found happens a lot here in, in Harbor Church over, over time. Sometimes it's difficult for us to have faith for ourselves, for what we're going through. It's hard to have hope in our circumstance, but it's amazing how someone near us might have hope for us at that time. And that is really, really significant. I need you to have hope for me. I need uh, to have faith for you. Um, and that's what happens as, as, we, as we come together. The, the second thing that they did was, it says that they, they joined together constantly in prayer. Prayer becomes uh, not just, a, okay, we're going to have our prayer time, you know, but it becomes the conversation. The air we breathe is, is uh, a conversation with the Lord together. And uh, I admit that um, prayer has always been a little bit uh, hinky for me. Um, I, I do it, but I, it, usually it's in the car when I'm, I don't know why, you know, some people sing the radio, I don't, I don't turn on the radio, I just, uh, God and I have our talks a lot of times driving, uh, he probably wishes he had a seatbelt, but, um, you know, the, but there's something about a conversation where, where we can bring our issues and concerns and questions, and God can bring his issues and concerns and, and questions to us and it's mutual. And, and when we're together as a community and not isolated and praying, this conversation takes on a, a tremendous uh, significance. It's not individuals having their little prayer time. It's there's something about the interaction of God and his people and the people together with their Lord and this conversation happening all the time and together in prayer is uh, unstoppable. And, and then the third thing that they did, which uh, uh, is Peter jumps up and grabs uh, the Bible and says, okay, look, it's written in the Psalms. Here's the Psalms. A couple of Sundays, they begin to look at the scripture and say, what does this mean for our situation? How do we apply this in our circumstance? And, uh, and I believe that's still what we do. We need to look at the scripture and uh, and say, Lord, what do you have in this for me? What do you have in this for us? <clears throat> How does this impact us or change us or, or empower us? What is it that you're speaking into our lives? Um, so that's all the good that they were doing. Um, and then things went weird. Uh, I mean, I've been in the church a long time. Uh, not you know, I've only been here for two hours, but um, but uh, the church has always struggled with this issue of are we going to be an organization with structure and leadership and policies, or are we going to be an organism? Are we going to be something alive that the Holy Spirit works in, we and we grow and move and and uh, trust God as we go in a very loosey-goosey kind of way. Which is it? Uh, back in the 50s, uh, the, the phrase uh, mainline denominations came about. You ever heard that phrase? It actually comes from, I think, outside of uh, Pennsylvania. They had the mainline the highway around town. And, uh, and Kodak was really big in our country. Just explosive. And they came up with a way of uh, organizing corporately. And virtually every uh, denomination uh, in America copied Kodak's organizational structure at that time. Isn't that weird? Uh, I, it doesn't, I mean, it's just a little trivia there, but um, of course now Kodak, you know, do they even exist? I don't even know. Well, do any of the denominations exist? I don't know. <laughs> so, but what happened was they got really big on organization. 
and they could organize, they could structure, there were charts and all these things, uh, accountability, and, and it, was, it was good, it was fine. Uh, they built a great organization. But then, in the uh, 60s and 70s, you know, when Dave and I were hanging out, you know, and uh, in the parks, there was almost a, a, a wave away from the institutional, the organizational, and into the organic. Isn't that right? It was people gathering together in homes and parks and wherever they were and uh, worshiping and praying, teaching, each other, sharing scripture together. And it was a very exciting time. People getting baptized in the ocean. Uh, not people in Nebraska, but, but those, <laughs> those who were near the ocean were, you know. And, uh, and, and there was like a, a revival took place in, in our country. Um, all over this organism. We're alive. We're different. we're not like that. Now, which one is right? Hmm? Which which one is the right way to go? Actually, I think what happens is uh, the church is uh, an organization that every once in a while comes alive, it comes organic, and it's also an organism, live, growing, kind of out of control thing that every once in a while, miraculously, accomplishes something because it gets a little structure going. It's a, it, it happens both ways, doesn't it? And so what happens is, as the, the, the followers of Jesus are gathered and they're, they're meeting together and they're praying and, and they're looking at scripture, applying it to their lives, the least organizationally savvy person of the whole 120, Peter, decides he's going to organize. What? I mean, he's the one who was kind of bipolar the whole time he was with Jesus. And, you know, uh, Jesus says, on uh, you, I'm going to build my church. And then the very next chapter, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> you know, and Peter's going, well, which am I? <laughs> you know, uh, so he decides, oh, I got to do something here. Got to build the church. Jesus said that. So what am I going to do? Let's get organized. We need 12. Because there were 12 tribes of Israel. We don't have, one of them just uh, killed himself. So we don't have that. So now what are we going to do? Well, we better replace them. And so you find a verse in the Psalms that says, well, you ought to replace them. And I think that that's a misuse of scripture. <laughs> you know, he does one verse that talks about, you know, if place be deserted, don't dwell. Okay, we all know uh, Judas is dead. <laughs> then he jumps over a whole another psalm picks out one little verse and says, so see, this is what God wants us to do. And I'm thinking, no, don't listen to Peter. Do not listen to Peter. He may have ADHD himself, you know, and so he can preach. We know that, but I don't know about the rest of it. And uh, shoo. And so he comes up, with, you know, we've got to do this. And they, and they start. When you're in between and, and you're waiting for God to do something fresh and new. You're waiting to, to go out and, and, and in faith and, and you're, you're wanting things to happen. Why is the tendency always to, let's make some decisions. Let's organize. Why? You want to do something. You got to do something. <laughs> yes. We got to do something. And so that's what they did. And they get together, they find two guys, you know, and uh, and then they pull out the dice. Okay, here we go, Lord. I hope up these dice roll good. Pooh, and, and they shoot craps, and Matthias is picked. He is never mentioned again in the Bible, ever. <laughs> Nothing ever came from Matthias. Isn't that something? He is like disappeared. From this moment on, good choice, Peter. <laughs> you know, uh, there, there's a billboard in the outside of Brownsville, Texas, uh, the radio station. Uh, over there, uh, Q ninety four point five, The Rock. Cool. So they have this big billboard, on the and uh, it says, uh, "Everything happens for a reason." Sometimes the reason is you're stupid and you do crazy bad decisions. And I wanted, I, I wish Peter could have seen that 
billboard. <laughs> you know? Um, and now, I'm not saying that he wasn't uh, well intended. I'm not saying he wasn't serious. He had probably thought this is, you know, this is what we need to do. This is how we'll do it. It's just been very weird. It was the last thing, the last decision they made before the Holy Spirit came through. <laughs> Chapter 2 opens with the Holy Spirit unleashing everything and, and going wacky. This is the last thing they did on their own. <laughs> now, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I think there's only one thing that we need to know. There's only one thing we need to know when we're in our new twenty times. <clears throat> Jesus said it at the end of his ministry, Matthew, uh, where is it in Matthew? Um, Matthew 20, 20, 20, 20. Uh, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize. Oh, and the funny thing was, this was the, uh, the 11 disciples went to him up on the mountain and, and they worshiped him, and some of them doubted, you know, they, they weren't all convinced. But, uh, Go and make disciples of all nations. And, and then it comes down to the very last words. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I am with you. That is all we need to know. That's all we need. It's the very thing that when Moses, after he killed the guy and was exiled and he was living out in the wilderness and working for his father-in-law, tending sheep and all this stuff, and he sees the burning bush and uh, and he hears God speak to him and uh, and, and Moses says, uh, here am I. And then then God says to him, I've seen the suffering of my people. I've heard their cries of agony. I've seen the oppression that's happened to them uh, from the Egyptians. And I'm going to bring them out of slavery. I'm going to bring them out of that place. And I'm going to give them their own land. And, and Moses, you're going to go back to Pharaoh now and do that. And it was like this. You can hear the brakes squealing. <laughs> and then the conversation ground. Boom, it stopped. And Moses went from here. Here am I, Lord, to um, who am I, Lord? <laughs> what you talking about, Willis? You know, and uh, Hebrew. And uh, <laughs> but but this uh, who am I to do this? This is one of the few questions in the Bible that's directly asked to God that God shifts the answer. Who am I? Moses asked to do this. And God said, I am with you. That was his answer. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, what your background is, what you're struggling with now, whether your father-in-law is a kind employer or a bad one. Nothing matters except I will be with you. And when and later when Moses starts complaining about, I don't say I can't make a speech impediment or disabilities, what, what, is it, what does God say? I will Give you the words to say. I, I will be with you. The very thing, the very promise that that uh, that Jesus makes to his followers. When Moses uh, dies and uh, Joshua takes over, um, it's interesting. Um, in Joshua chapter one. Um, God said, no one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I'm with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Where have you heard that? That's what Jesus said. The same promise. And then down a little bit it says, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. 
I'm with you. And that's what we need to know when we're in between. You don't have to have guidance. guidance. I mean, I'd love to have guidance. I wish, you know, that every morning when I got up, kind of like what Eileen used to do, uh, there's a list of what I'm supposed to do, you know. And uh, wouldn't that be cool if God kind of wrote that on the wall, you know, or you have a little, uh, little whiteboard, you know, in the bedroom there, and uh, you wake up in the morning and there's, okay, do this, 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 and this. Any questions, you know? And wouldn't that be so cool? Then we would never need faith. Isn't that great? We could live our whole lives without faith, without having to trust God, without having to say, Lord, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here, but could you show me? We could live our whole life without needing Jesus to be with us. Wouldn't that be great? We could have it all our, because we would know we don't need Jesus. We, we got guidance. You know, and I've been a pastor way too long, and, and one of the things that happens is people often would come to counseling and something, they'd have, sometimes they'd actually pull out pieces of paper uh, with questions on the, check off the questions. <laughs> and, and after a while, I kind of go, it doesn't matter how I answer these because there's going to be another one, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, I realize well, they're not wanting faith. They're not wanting a relationship with Christ that, that they're not going to be able to control. They want some answers, and if I can give them some answers, tell them this is what's supposed to happen, this is how it goes, they don't need the Lord. When I was young and stupid, I used to give them answers. Clear ones. Fast ones. Sometimes I'd answer before they had the question. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> no! Wait, I haven't asked yet. No! Because sometimes you're stupid and you make crazy bad decisions. That's why. That's the reason. <laughs> but isn't that weird that the thing we long for, that we think would be so, make us so strong spiritually and everything, or make everything so clear, is the very thing that would undermine our relationship with Christ and make it so we didn't ever have to have faith. be with you always even to the end I will be with you well Lord what should we do in this situation I will be with you but what are we going to say if this happens I will be with you but Lord they don't understand you know and it's kind of confusing you know, I will be with you but Lord I feel so alone in this I don't know if I can do this it's just you know my heart's breaking I will be with you I will be with you. That's all we need to know. So, what do we do? We're in between. There's a great adventure about to happen. We know in chapter two. I don't want to. I don't want to give it away. You know, uh, things are going to break loose a little bit there. But um, what could we do in the meantime? to prepare our lives, our hearts, and our minds, and our lives for the next step that God has for us. What could we do? Well, I sat down and made a little list of what I need to do. I decided, if I'm going to do this, kind of like the uh, field day yesterday, if I'm, gonna, if I'm going to be ready for the next thing that God has in store. I need to do some unpacking. So here's a list of some of the ones that I need to unpack. I'm not talking about you all. I'm just talking about me. Um, disappointments that I carry for way too long. That I keep going back to. Oh, man, I'm really disappointed. Oh, uh, resentments for small and great offenses that I've endured. Um, for some reason, I, I 
I have a separate uh, suitcase full of those that I keep with me uh, most of the time, so I can return to them. Uh, I need to unpack defensiveness that I use to shield me from real and imagined insults. Um, I'm actually really good at playing defense, at being defensive. Wait, that one sounds negative, doesn't it? <laughs> negative. <laughs> if you played defense, like Larry did, it's not negative. But if you're defensive, kind of is, you know, right? Yeah. So anyway, I get defensive, and I have, I have my little mannerisms, uh, mind games, and word tricks, and things to deflect real and imagined insults. I need to unpack those. Um, trophies to my failures uh, that I carry around in my heart that remind me of my limitations. Um, a few of those. Uh, I also need to unpack trophies to my successes that I carry around with me to remind me that I used to be somebody. <laughs> you know? Got to keep those. Uh, another thing I need to unpack is my need to be kind of, this, kind of personal. My need to be right, strong, smart, good, and fun so people might love me. Yeah, but that's because I'm right. <laughs> I mean, we all have things that we do, you know. We heard the message long ago, you know, I'll love you if. I'll love you if uh, you're perfect, or if you're good, or if you're smart, or if you're, in our case, if you're quiet. Uh, I just didn't get that. But um, anyway, so I try to be right, strong, smart, good, and fun. So people might love me. And... Uh, I think I, I think I need to unpack that one and just leave it behind. Okay. Maybe we'll leave it in this room and then the bulldozers can come and just <laughs> take it out. Uh, okay, one more here for you. Um, I'm going to unpack uh, my anger and frustration and my fear and loathing when the world doesn't go the way I expect it. When the world doesn't go the way I expect it to, I get so frustrated and angry and fierce. You know, I don't know why. It brings all that up. And it's like, what's wrong with this world that it doesn't fulfill my expectations? I expect things to be a certain way. How dare the entire cosmos let me down? Why am I mad about it? Why wouldn't they let me down? And who cares about why? Okay, there's another one I'm going to add them. I'm going to unpack my expectations. How about that? This is the way it ought to be. This is the way it's going to work out. This is the way it needs to be. This is what I got. How about I leave that here and let the bulldozers take it down? Okay. Disappointment, resentment, defensiveness, trophies to failure, trophies to success. I need to be right, strong, smart, good. Uh, fun, so people love me, and my anger and frustration when the world doesn't go the way I expected. You know, we sang to that today, didn't we? Lay down your burdens. What do you do in the in-between time? Lay down your burdens. Lay down your hurt. We sang that. Lay down your heart. Come as you are. Wow. That could preach, Dave. You know, in the in-between time, that's a time for us to take all the burdens that you know, we haul around with us. And Jesus said, you know what? I want you to come follow me. Okay, Lord, let me just get my burdens back. Okay, I think I got it, Lord. No, I just leave them. No, you know, I never know when I'm going to leave resentments. You know, I don't know if you can handle No, really, John, you, you can, no, you never know when you're going to need them. And so, what if we laid down our burdens? Lay down our hurts. Lay down our heart. Okay, this is where you are. You know what I realize? If I do this, imagine all the time we've got. I've spent so much time brooding over resentments and failures and successes and that. You know, and I spent all my time agitating over the with that gone, what am I gonna do? 
Uh, you guys have terrible ideas. <laughs> I mean, think about that. What do you do with your time and your energy and your thoughts and everything if you're not dealing with your burdens? You're so freed up. Let me give you a hint of what not to do. Can you set the burdens aside? You're in that in-between time. You're waiting for God to take you on the next step. Don't do what Peter did. Don't jump in and try and fix stuff while you're waiting. Just to get your life. Burden-free life. Wouldn't that be different? A burden-free life. Now, down the road, I may collect a few more resentments and stuff, so I may have to do this more than once, okay? But as of today, time to let that go. And I invite you to do it too, because we're in this in-between time. We're not in heaven yet. And, and all that we need is to know one thing, which is what? Okay. I am with you always. Amen. I am with you always. Say it. I am, I am with, with you, you always. always. How long? Always. always. To the end of the day. Okay. So let's pray, Lord. Thank you for your commitment to be with us always. Thank you for your love that doesn't waver. And thank you for the invitation to dump that load of burdens. Let them go. So we can. We can be free to follow on you. Lord, give us the courage to not look for guidance, but to just trust you because you're with us. That's all we need.